Okay, well, I'll just give you a little bit of background. Um, I, I, f I first got very interested in, in this whole issue um, in 1986, when, when I, probably a year or two after I moved to Melbourne, uh, towards the end of my training in psychiatry, and, and um, I read an article in the British Medical Journal which described the establishment in London of the setting up of the Medical Foundation for the Care of Victims of Torture. And, you know, I thought this was a... The, the mental health impact of, of extreme trauma and, and torture was obviously something that psychiatrists, coming back to your point about politics and, and political um, issues, um, that psychiatrists should be interested in. So I looked around in Melbourne to see if there was uh, a service or an agency that I could actually help with that um, was looking after the, the needs of uh, refugees and, and particularly survivors of torture and trauma. And at that time, there was nothing. Um, despite the fact that we were in the process of taking large numbers of um, boat people um, at that time from Vietnam and other countries, Cambodia and, and so on. And um, so together with a, a group of other people, um, uh, we established what became known as Foundation House, the Victorian F Foundation for Survivors of Torture, which um, then, um, I suppose, has been going strong now for about um, over 20 years. And the, most amazing, the reason I'm mentioning this is because I, I've, I've continued to work clinically and, and did some research in that area over that time, even though it wasn't my main job, it wasn't my main, main role. I was working with young people mainly with emerging uh, mental health problems. Um, but it was a very important area to me. And, and at the time, in the late 80s, um, early 90s, it was, it was very uncontroversial, actually. Um, people, uh, the whole community w could easily get behind that issue what was quite striking was how little knowledge there was in the community and how much denial there was. Um, um, you know, your, your average suburban uh, Melbourneian uh, found it actually amazing that people could actually be tortured or they might actually go through extreme experiences of migration. That was something that wasn't in their consciousness at all and it was quite surprising to me that they hadn't even thought about it, most people, uh, at that point. Um, but anyway, th that issue did improve, and for a while there, for several years, I think there was a lot of community support for the issue, certainly from members of Amnesty and organisations like that, from the philanthropic sector, and the foundation really developed in a very good way for the first few years. Then came, along came Jerry Hand and um, the Keating government's uh, change of heart um, and, and their mandatory detention policy. And, you know, we, we kept um, working with, with, within that system. And, and it has actually was, some of you in the audience maybe have direct experience of that, but it was a pretty benign regime, even though it was mandatory detention, it was relatively benign. Um, it was run by the government, the Commonwealth government, so we had a bunch of, you know, federal bureaucrats basically operating the, the detention centre out there in Maribyrnong and, and other places. We didn't have the, the desert, you know, the desert solution at that point. Um, and um, anyway, as you all know, things went from bad to worse that, uh, from, from, from that time on. So that's what I'm going to talk about a, a little bit. And then, obviously, because it is a political as well as a, you know, a moral and, and clinical issue, um, we, we're going to need to have some discussion and debate about how we're going to respond to it and what the range of views in the audience. I've got no idea what, what, your, what your views might be and what, what spectrum uh, there are. So... I'm going to just dip into this talk that I gave earlier in the year to um, the refugee uh, and asylum seekers uh, group at Melbourne Uni, um, probably about two or three months ago. And um, it's got some data in it, some information, and, and also some of the issues are highlighted. Um, now, obviously, you know, I and, and many others would lay a lot of blame on, on the Howard government here because... Uh, although it was, it, it's been a bipartisan mistake, and I, I think at the moment we're seeing, you know, the race to the bottom of the last uh, X months, um, and we're still fairly close to the bottom, I'd say, on the issue. But um, the, the person or the government that took it in the, really in that big race to the bottom, as you all know, what was the Howard government? This is a quote from Mungo McCallum, um, and you know, it's very, very trenchant criticism of the way the issue was exploited um, for political reasons and. Actually, a lot of people suffered in the process, hence the fairly emotive term that was used there. Um, I suppose you, you'd be as familiar than, as me, or, or perhaps more familiar, that, uh, of, the, of the numbers involved. This is old data. Actually, the numbers are much higher these days than, than when this data was collected. Uh, I suppose the main point about the large volume of people that are involved in these massive movements and migrations is the proportion of people who are coming from war zones who have actually experienced extreme trauma or torture. It's at least a third. 
And this is certainly what we saw when we were working with the foundation and, and the clients of the foundation, that of people f fleeing war zones or, or dictatorships, as, it, as they were then in the 1980s in particular, um, you know, up a third or more had actually experienced systematic torture or extreme trauma of that nature. So there was definitely a need, a need for specialised mental health care for them in a, in a holistic sort of sense. And I think in, in some ways it, it points the way to the sort of mental health care we ought to provide to everybody, which is very holistic, not just purely, you know, a pill or, or even a, a therapy, but, but thinking of the whole person, their body, their mind and um, the way we relate to them. And so I think there were a lot of really good lessons learned from working with this extremely traumatised group. In fact, um, about 30% of adult mental disorder is, is related to, uh, to trauma and neglect earlier in life. So it is a, a, a sort of major risk factor for all forms of mental, of mental ill health. So again, it's something that's, that's relevant to, to uh, I think, mental health care in general. And what you see, I suppose, is, is this, this mixture of of issues and the, you know the, the, the various other reasons why people um, leave their country of origin, which you know has has been kind of um, been some very moralistic sort of views expressed about that in, in recent times, and you know um, leading to terms like queue jumpers or people getting the inside track is the most recent version of that. Um, so I should say, by the way, I'm a boat person myself. I, I came to Australia when I was 15 on a boat, and but I had a very I had a very positive. Um, very positive experience of that, and, and uh, it was made to feel very, very welcome in this country. So, you know, this is one of the reasons why I think that we've got to really look at ourselves a lot more carefully. So, this issue of torture, I think that's something that um, certainly in the, in the tribunal hearings, I went to a lot of uh, refugee review tribunal hearings um, with, with my patients over the years, and um, the issue of torture and its significance in the case was was something that, um, that was always very, very important um, to establish uh, if that had been the case. But even if people had been um, tortured on several occasions, we, 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 um, we found tribunal, the tribunal members weren't, weren't that impressed about it quite often and um, they didn't necessarily want to hear about it. And they even questioned the relevance of that experience to, to seeking asylum and, and, and refugee status, which kind of astounded me when I first saw that occurring in the tribunal. Um, especially when, when uh, the definition of refugee and, and uh, the, the, the definition of eligibility for a protection visa depends on the well-founded fear of persecution. And if you've actually been systematically tortured on you know, even several occasions uh, and, and that's been discounted in the, in the, in the decision-making process, then that was something that was quite shocking to me. So the torture issue was what, I suppose, led me into it. And, uh, and I, I was... At first, very surprised that people could, could actually withstand that experience and, and still come out on the other side, even, even vaguely psychologically intact. And, and, and yet, um, even though almost everyone affected by these experiences of extreme torture or trauma, um, um, that there were definitely always short-term and even medium-term effects. It was quite amazing how, after a period of time, especially with the right recovery orientated uh, approach, that it, uh, the number that had longer-term sequelae dropped to about 25%. So even with the most extreme experiences you can imagine, the resilience of the people was quite, quite extraordinary, actually. So, so there are a lot of things to learn from this. And um, I suppose you all know the history of, of, of the different eras, of, I suppose, the, the, the increasing consciousness of what the refugee experience was actually like. I suppose that's something that we learned in the late 80s, that that people started to understand, I think, for the first time, really, what, what it was actually like. Or maybe it was understood before and then forgotten as, you know, as, as time went on. But we have had a whole series of, refu of refugees in, you know, in this country, even going back to the first fleet, you could say, you know, in, in a way that... I've just been reading Thomas Keneally's book, Origins to Eureka, and you can see the experiences of those people, um, you know, some of the same traumatic and... and uh, uh, I suppose, displacement experiences there, again, involuntarily uh, having to move countries and, and certainly the political prisoners of... Um, there's another great book, Death or Liberty, I don't know if you've seen that, um, written by... Um, I think it's Tony Moore as the author. It's, uh, it's in readings, it's just come out this year. It's about the history of political prisoners in this country and, and um, it's not just the Irish, it's um, also the Chartists and, and the, uh, um, the Toll Puddle Martyrs, for example, some Scottish... Scottish, uh, Scottish martyrs. There's a whole series of groups who were really dis 
uh, dissidents and, and, uh, and political um, prisoners and, and how they uh, were, were brought here. So there's quite a long tradition of, 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 um, of dealing with this issue in different ways. And, um, yeah. Okay. Now, just returning now to the whole issue of trauma and stress, the, the, the whole impact of, of, that trauma has on people has been, um, I suppose, progressively understood. Going back probably to the 19th century, the American Civil War was the first time when when uh, I suppose various versions of shell shock and, and war trauma were recognised for the first time. Probably the most graphic um, and most extreme sort of cases of that came out of the First World War. Um, then another, another definition of, of the response to extreme trauma was the concentration camp syndrome recognised in Holocaust survivors. And then what, what, what really uh, clinched the, the, the issue as a diagnostic issue was, was the development um, of, um, well, in the wake of the Vietnam War, recognition of what, was, what became post-traumatic stress disorder amongst Vietnam veterans. And, and um, so this became then a respectable psychiatric disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, <clears throat> I suppose the key features of it have been um, two things. Uh, although you do see a lot of... Um, emotional disturbance and often secondary substance abuse and alcohol problems, behavioural problems. But the essence of it is um, the, the re-experiencing of the traumatic events, you know, in other words, through nightmares or, or bad dreams or even um, memories flooding back in everyday life into the person's consciousness, triggered often by something that reminds them of the, of the earlier trauma. So that's the, the re-experiencing dimension. And, and in order to cope with that overwhelming sort of re-experiencing and, and, the, and the feelings that go with it, people have a, a numbing or an avoidance defence mechanism, really, that sort of balances that out. So you see the, the oscillation between those two types of uh, subjective experience. And that's what's, what underpins the experience of extreme trauma, whatever, that, whatever its nature. And obviously in, in younger children who are the, who's subject, subject to abuse or trauma... Uh, of various kinds, then they're less, even less well-equipped than adults to, to actually cope with that. So it has much more far-reaching effects on their development as, 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 uh, as people. And, and hence, the, hence we, have, we see the sequelae of that in, in our work in, in mental health. But um, in terms of refugees, quite often they're adults and quite often they're adolescents, actually. And, and if they're adolescents, adolescents seem particularly sensitive to, to, to these sort of ex- forms of extreme trauma. Um, and we might remember that usually it's soldiers, um, whether they're child soldiers or even slightly more grown-up soldiers, it's usually young men in particular that, that, are, are the, are they, that they're the brunt of these sorts of experiences. And that's certainly um, what you see on Christmas Island at the moment. It, it, if you go to Christmas Island, you will see it's mainly young men that, that are um, behind the wire there. Uh, and they've been sent as the advance party, really, as, as the people who are going to rescue their families from the extreme situations that they're living in. So young men, I think, are, are particularly in the front line. So I'm, I've mentioned all that. These are some of the other things down the bottom that you can see too. Less commonly, you see psychotic episodes and um, certainly a lot of substance abuse. Um, uh, Vietnam veterans, I think, are, are particularly you know, uh, well recognised to, to have suffered from that as a secondary you know, set of problems that they had. Um, I suppose it's a form of self-medication because of unresolved, uh, uh, to deal with unresolved trauma. So I don't want to go into too much detail, but just trying to give you some idea that there's been a lot of attention in the mental health field to this issue. It's a really, really important issue. And, um, you know, I suppose people who have been through refugee trauma um, and, uh, and, and the like um, are, are sort of a, a kind of a special example. And there, there is this idea that was on one of the earlier slides of the second injury, if you've been through extreme stress, if you then are subjected to a secondary stress, even if the secondary stress isn't as severe as the first, so you might have been through three episodes of systematic torture in, in, in um, El Salvador or in Chile or somewhere, um, or in the Middle East, let's say, or in Sri Lanka, um, and then you, you're brought to Australia and, and, um, and you're placed in a detention centre, or even if you're in the community and you're in an asylum-seeking situation, what, what, we've, what we saw very, very commonly in these people was um, even though the, the, uh, the, st- the stress, stresses they experienced here might not be ob- objectively as severe as what they had been through, they had extremely powerful effects and caused major decompensations. And, and, um, um, uh, and this was an example of what's called second injury, especially because 
the conditions they were placed in, like a detention centre, often were, were very reminiscent of um, political prisons and other sorts of environments they had been in in their countries of origin. And um, this was really not really understood or not really... It, it wasn't um, sought to be understood by the government, I don't think. Uh, I think they deliberately didn't want to see that, that link. What we saw during the 90s, and I'm sure many of you have lived through this too, was was a conversion of these places, which, as I say, were fairly benign. They certainly were... People weren't free to come and go in detention centres in the early 90s, but they weren't surrounded by razor wire. They weren't in, in desert situations. They weren't in, in highly inhospitable climates. So I think there was a, a, a deliberate attempt to, to, to turn them into um, quite severe prisons and with a punitive sort of element. That was probably the difference. There wasn't really a punitive element in place in the early 90s. And that was introduced as part of the whole idea of deterrence. And I don't know if, if has anyone heard of this man, Dr. Sultan. He was he was um, a detainee in Villawood in Sydney, and he wrote um, in, a, in a co-authored piece with um, Zachary Steele in in the Lancet, I think it was, or the British Medical Journal, in 2001. He wrote about his experiences and. And, um, you know, it's, it's well worth a read. He, he was a, a medical doctor from, from Iran. I think he was from Iran originally. And um, he was extremely articulate and wrote about the whole experience of, of detention at that time. Yeah. And, you know, the, the sort of telling conclusion was I made, I made the decision thinking Australia was a safe haven. It's my fault. I didn't have enough information about Australia. From the distance, it looked like a sophisticated, compassionate country that was signatory to the Refugee Convention. So all of that experience that he described, he wasn't expecting it. Um, and it was a very big shock. So this is some research that we did, um, my colleague um, Richard Thompson and I, um, in the 1990s. And this was in, in the relatively benign period, I would say. you know, um, And it showed that uh, we compared levels of, of psychiatric disorder <coughs> amongst detainees versus asylum seekers in the community versus refugees who were, who were um, permanent residents, who had, who had achieved permanent resident status, but who had been through traumatic experiences earlier, and then the general mi migrant community. And, and as you can see, there's a, there's a kind of a dose-response effect there. Um, and even asylum seekers in the community have got pretty high levels of, um, of, of uh, psychiatric disorder and distress. And so... And these were, would have been people on, on temporary protection visas or, or with a certain amount or a fair bit of uncertainty. You know, in, in either they hadn't received a decision or they had received a decision, but it was temporary protection. And subsequent work from Zachary Steele and other people in Sydney showed that um, the temporary protection visa process in particular was, was, was very, very damaging to people psychologically because of the uncertainty and because of the fact that they were living... Um, uh, you know, in really quite difficult and practical situations, but more psychologically, the, the situation was very uncertain for them, and they certainly couldn't be reunited with their, with their family, had very little social support, and, and, and so on. And there's lots of other research. Um, this, this is a, mo a more recent paper, um, I think published... Uh, yeah, it was published this year by Guy Coffey. I don't know, many of you may have heard of Guy. He's an extremely... Uh, experienced psychologist working at um, Foundation House. He's worked in this area for many, many years. He, prior to that, he worked for the Area Mental Health Service, the South West Area Mental Health Service that covered the detention centre in Maribyrnong. So he saw more extreme sort of referrals from, from there. Um, and they did a, um, a, an assessment of, of uh, 17 people who had been previously... Um, residents of, the, of detention centres in Australia. And um, they found a persistence. In, in, that can be summarised, all of those effects there, as a persistence of problems. Even though they, were, they had been placed in a more secure environment in the community, there were long-lasting effects of, of, of this detention experience. So despite the resilience of people, um, there is long-term damage apparently occurring. And the Assam Seeker Resource Centre, uh, Dr Suresh Sundram has done some more recent research showing uh, some very similar findings, actually, uh, which haven't been published yet. So it's not a, it's not a trivial thing. And, and you have to remember, these are people who all have been found after a protracted process to have been genuine refugees. So they have done nothing wrong. They've, um, they've, they've actually, their claims were supported. But 
we've handled it in such a way as to, as to produce psychiatric disorder in these people and, and long-term, um, um, uh, I suppose, distress and disability. So um, I think um, that's, that's the side of the coin, obviously, I'm, I'm wanting to emphasise here and, and why I would have made that comment in January about them about the detention centres really being factories for the production of mental disorder, which they clearly are on the, on, on the basis of this sort of evidence. Now, what I actually did say, I, I, was, um, uh, it was in, I, I commented in response to a question from the media uh, about this issue, and what I actually said was the government at that time had been, attempt, been attempting to move us away from that more extreme situation. That's what I, I believed was happening, and, and there certainly was, at least in policy terms, if not fully in implementation, um, a humanisation of, of, of that policy. It certainly wasn't an ideal policy, but the government was sort of edging its way into a, into a more humane situation and would have moved more quickly, I believe, if it had been, hadn't been wedged, continually wedged on the issue, or if, or if it had had the courage, particularly when there was a, um, an opposition leader that wasn't um, so extreme on the, on the, on the issue, to actually... Um, to try to get some bipartisan movement away from that really quite uh, ridiculous position that both parties have got themselves into. Um, but unfortunately that, that didn't occur and, I, and the, the media actually chose to say that, that um, what I had said was criti being cr particularly critical of the, of the present government, of the Rudd government at the time. It was in fact my main criticism had been focused on the, on the previous government's quite extreme policy. So just, let's just try to set the record straight there. But I think what I was trying to do was encourage the government to be a bit braver in moving that direction. And um, they, they went the other way, in fact. They, 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 they became more timid and actually have gone uh, um, more strongly down this, this, this track, I think. Now, th maybe in the discussion we can see what the solution is, because there are some issues to be dealt with in terms of you know, the, the movement of people, and you know, there are obviously big issues to be looked at here, but, but uh, I'd be interested in your views. Um, I could go through the, these different cases. Um, um, perhaps I'll just pick one. Um, there was, um, a, there's, I think it's okay to talk about this person because he, it, his story has been reported in the media. But but he was in Baxter, and uh, his his daughter was there with him. She, I think, she was about eight years of age at the time, and uh, some quite false claims were made about uh, the risk of. Uh, sexual assault by him against his daughter, by, by the immigration staff. And um, so he was separated from his daughter. Um, just he, the father and the daughter were in detention. The mother was back in, in Iran. She, she was, the parents were separated. And um, during this period of separation, while the claims were looked into, he was actually cleared by the, the South Australian uh, um, equivalent of human services. Basically, they looked into the case and found no evidence at all for this claim having been made. But in the meantime, the daughter had been deported to Iran and sent back to her mother without his knowledge. So, so he, was, he, he wasn't aware of this. And um, he was completely you know, uh, distraught by this whole series of events. And he was then transferred to Maribyrnong, where I got to see him. And I think um, you mentioned Julian Burnside. I think Julian Burnside helped to get him out in the end of, 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 um, of Maribyrnong and have him placed in the community. And it took about 12 months. But during that time, I've seen a lot of patients over the last 25 years, but I've never seen someone who was more hopeless and, and more demoralised than this man, and it's just unbelievable um, the effects of, of this whole experience on him. Now, these days he has actually made a pretty remarkable sort of recovery, I think, and he has actually met, met up with his daughter you know, on a visit. She's come to Australia to visit him, but it took about seven or eight years, I think, for all of that to get sorted out. and, and um, so he's, he's just one example. Um, there are other cases there I could quote, and, and um, cases where people have developed quite serious psych, uh, psychotic illnesses as a result of the detention experience and, and have never really fully recovered as a result. So um, now um, it, it's, it seems pretty clear in most of those cases that, that, that um, these, these more severe illnesses would not have occurred had they not been placed in these environments, although without, you know, Randomised trials, you can't be 100% certain about that, but nevertheless, um, you know, it, the, the damage d d does seem to be related to the experience. It's, there's also an effect on health professionals, and, and you've probably seen, I've certainly experienced these feelings myself when I was working more intensively in the area. 
um, the helplessness and the frustration and the hopelessness that, that the, they, the people feel themselves gets taken on board by the professionals and, and whether they're lawyers or whether they're psychologists or whether whoever they are or visitors. People, there are a lot of people, maybe some of you in the audience are in that category, have visited um, people in detention as friends or, or community visitors and, and uh, there are quite a few people doing that. Um, and they would be subject to, the, to, to, to many of these, these sorts of feelings. And, and um, a lot of volunteers in the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre, I think, who might be at risk of this too, although the morale down there does seem to be fantastic when I, met, when I visited. And um, you do get this vicari- these vicarious sort of effects. And you often get splits you know, amongst how to handle the situation, you know, amongst advocates in the field. So it's, it's, it's because of what you were saying, the, the political nature of it, as well as the, the humanitarian nature. It's, um, it's a minefield, really, uh, as, as an area to work in. And there's a lot of, I suppose, maturity and, and uh, support in, in the various systems that are involved. Yeah, okay. Probably don't. So I think... We can talk about the solutions. I, um, it, I think, obviously, the first thing is moral leadership and a rational approach, which, to some extent, the Prime Minister was, was alluding to, even though she was walking both sides of the street, I think, before the election. But she did say some things that were pointing in the right, in the right direction, I thought. It does need moral leadership um, in, in the context of um, I mean, this kind of major sort of global problem. Uh, it needs to be bipartisan, I think, too, this, this kind of um, wedging and... and uh, and uh, you know there are, there are quite a number of issues that should be bipartisan. Mental health is another. I think the support for mental health is what we've had in mental health in general has been bipartisan neglect, and, and what we'd like to see is bipartisan support. In, in the election campaign, we saw a differential opening up between the two major parties on levels of support for mental health, which was kind of weird, but, um, and hopefully we can close that gap again um, now post-election. But I think you know, we do need uh, a much more mature approach, and maybe we can get that in the new parliament. I don't know what you think, but it's, it's totally unpredictable, so it's got to be a chance. Um, I think going back to the whole idea of what, what gave this country its sort of identity, that, um, that's a very, whether it's honoured more in the breach than the observance, I'm not sure, but, but, um, but certainly um, it's something we all say we believe in a fair go, isn't it? And, and what does that mean? You know, what does it actually translate to in real human terms um, for people? How, how far does it extend? You know, it'd be interesting to discuss that. And you know, I thought there was a window of opportunity when Tony Abbott did offer to give the, that uh, young Afghan boy some surfing lessons. Although Tony's not that good at surfing anyway. But <laughs> so I, I don't know. I think I, I'm not sure. It's been a bit rambling what I've had to say. I, I, I don't work that actively in the area over the last two or three years, um, but I still have um, a number of asylum, former asylum seeker patients that I still look after, and so this area has been very important to me in my career and my, my life, really, and um, I guess you're all interested in it uh, here tonight, so otherwise you wouldn't be here, so I'd be very keen to hear your views, and you know, I'm sure there's a range of views, so I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Mm.